All right, welcome to another episode of Unusual Profits. I am your host, uh, Michael Gridley. Uh, this is my weekly podcast uh, where sometimes I interview people in interesting businesses and sometimes I talk about business ideas that I have, uh, but all in all, trying to produce really interesting content for people that are business people. And and today I have somebody that I've gotten to know um, from Twitter that I'm like really excited uh, to have. Uh, and it's Jesse Tinsley, who is, well, I guess now out of Sacramento. Jesse, that's where you are? <laughs> Yeah, originally from the Bay. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, yeah, just moved from uh, the Bay Area after spending most of my adult life and uh, to Sacramento. So happy to be here. Well, and for those of you just listening via audio, Jesse has like the coolest like Silicon Valley founder outfit on like uh, for those of you on video, you can see it. And someday when I'm cool, I will dress like that. So I'm glad I'm glad you're here helping me with my look as <laughs> yeah. well. Even though you, you, you just gotta you just that. gotta go and buy like 20 of the same shirts. It's uh you can ask my team, I wear the same thing every day. So <laughs> in uniform. <laughs> <laughs> super cool, super cool. Well, so today, you know, you're in the recruiting business, and this is a space to me that, as a business nerd, like I'm, I'm super curious about, um, and want to dig in with you about it. But, but before we do that, like, I'd love to hear, like, what does your company do? Like, uh, where's it located? How old is it? Like, give me, give me the thumbnail sketch of of your business, and it's Job Mobs, right? Am I pronouncing that correctly? That's correct, Job Mobs. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, t- so tell us about my- it. I started Job Mobs in, in 2012. Um, I started recruiting much, much sooner than that at 15 years old. Grew up in yeah. Silicon Valley and uh, my mother was head of TA. And so I learned, I did chores and recruiting and sourcing from a young age. I uh, was basically dropped out of college in, in 2012 and started Job Mobs. And uh, from there, basically, uh, we've worked with over 100 different companies. Uh, mostly in tech, but a, a few different segments like Web3, SaaS, health tech, and green tech. And we basically go plug into companies and help them scale. So we do recruiting as a service. And um, yeah, that's kind of the quick overview. Happy to dive into the weeds. There's a lot to uh, lot to unpack, but that's the yeah. high level. That's great. That's great. So, so you're specifically focused your business on the tech world and specifically Silicon Valley tech. Is that, is that, is that what I understand? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think Silicon Valley has expanded. It's like in the cloud now, right? It's global. We've been hiring more internationally the last two years than ever before. And that's because tech is truly global now. It's not just in San Francisco Bay Area. It's across the entire entire world. So, Yeah, super cool. So, okay, so really a focus on that. So, and it, and, and there's different models in which recruiting firms work, right? So there's direct hire, and then could you kind of walk through those? And then what, which approach do you guys do in particular? Yeah, so like when you think of like traditional staffing, you probably think of a firm that like helps you hire somebody and you get a placement fee when, or pay a placement fee once you hire that person. Um, another model is like temp staffing where you're hiring somebody on a temp basis and then you can convert them. Our model is much, much different. Uh, we look at ourselves less as like a staffing firm and more as a partner with our customers. And so we plug in and actually work with internal teams and help them grow. So an example of this, we've worked with like Coinbase when they were going through hyper growth, when they're growing from 200 to 1,000 people. And we basically have like rec- recruiting like SWAT teams that plug in. So you'll have like a recruiting manager and then like four or five recruiters that actually help you grow. Um, and so this happens a lot when like when companies go and add a lot of hiring to their plate that they didn't otherwise have resourcing for. Uh, we can basically come in and help them hit those those goals, right? Because um, it's hard to hire recruiters even, right? It's one of the hardest things to hire nowadays. And so if you were to go out and hire 50 recruiters internally, that might take you six months. Mm-hmm. Whereas us, you can say, hey, Jesse, we need 10 recruiters a month from now. We can help operationalize that and make sure you hit your goals over the next year. Right. Okay. So like if I go hire a recruiter, there's like, well, there's oftentimes for the types of roles you're talking about, there's direct hire where you pay a percentage but only upon completion, or there's like retained search, right? Where I may pay uh, a percentage of salary when all is said and done, but I pay a retainer, you know, upfront. So they work on it. Where do you kind of fit? So your business model is actually much more of a, like you parachute in a team for a fixed fee or do that, do they similarly have, um, you know, rewards for you based on performance? Yeah, so we, we've structured, we can structure a few different ways. Like we're less hung up on like the pricing model. Main thing that we're like focused on is outcomes. So like, mm-hmm. what are your goals? What do you want to achieve? And then let's work 
like basically create a plan and work backwards from there. That's more important for us. But um, most often we work on like a fixed fee. It's pretty pricey, but it ranges anywhere from like 15 to 25,000 a month per resource to get like direct numbers. Um, there, sometimes we'll bake in success fees with that. Um, other times it's just the flat monthly, which is actually really nice from like an accounting and like budgeting perspective. You know exactly like, hey, we're gonna hit 100 hires, it's gonna cost us X. And so for most companies that's preferable, but we we have different models. We're less concerned about the pricing, but just making sure that we can actually deliver the outcomes um, that companies want. Yeah. And so how many people do you have today? <laughs> we're growing quite uh, quite quickly internally. Um, right now we're somewhere in the, <laughs> we just onboarded a bunch of people. Um, I'm not sure the exact number. I think about 35 internally, but growing, um, we're gonna be growing to about 70 by the end of Q1. And we're also just announced we're launching international offices in India and Argentina, which is pretty exciting. We're pumped up about it. It can support a lot of different uh, customers because traditionally, like even at that price point that I shared, 15 to 25,000, that's really expensive for a lot of startups, right? Um, especially with international hiring. And so with these offices, we'll be able to help lower cost of hire, uh, especially in those regions, because we'll be actually hiring in those regions for tech companies as well. So we're excited about it. And uh, then all the new customers we can support with that. Yeah. And so then that kind of reflects the idea that so many companies, especially Silicon Valley startups, they've tapped out the opportunity of tech talent and folks they can hire out of California. So they're recruiting where the more people are kind of globally. That's that's the idea there. Definitely. I, I think there's there's plenty of great talent in California, but there's so much more when you just open up the lens, right? Like open up the funnel to a global environment as opposed to just one state or one region. Um, in fact, of our customers or even bids that we've gotten uh, in the last six months, I'd say 95% of them plan on hiring globally as opposed to just in one specific location. There's only a few companies that have really stuck to uh, bringing folks back to an office at some point in the future. Super interesting. So, so it sounds like your business model compared to most kind of search firms, especially the ones I've kind of dealt with, a lot of them are on kind of that direct hire model where they only eat what they kill. Um, but it sounds like you've figured out a way. Um, and I mean that from a lion standpoint, but it seems like you figured out a way to work yourself in as much less of a vendor and more of a partner for people just based on the way you've structured things and the pricing model and the type of services you're doing. Yeah, there's, there's two things to unpack there. I think one, we look at ourselves as a relationship building relationships with our customers over a 10 year time horizon. I'm still young in my career. And, and so it was a lot of our leadership team in terms of the next 10 years is what we're looking at. And so we want to like be that plug and play partner for companies as they scale. An example, like we don't work with them, but just saying like Google, right? Let's say Google needs to help to help hiring a thousand people. They don't have internal resources. We could plug in for six months, help them hit those hiring goals, roll off for six months and then repeat that for years, right? So it allows you to have flex in your hiring. Um, in, in going back to what you said in regards to like eat what you kill traditional staffing, that's what's nice about our model is like the culture gets really like, <laughs> it gets pretty toxic in a lot of those companies um, in regards to a lot of recruiters competing with each other internally with us. We work at 15 plus different customers. Our recruiters can promote on their own merit at each account and it doesn't impact anyone else on our team. And so it creates like a really co cohesive uh, recruiting environment for our team it, where they have a ton of support because we're not just putting resources into these companies. It's a full like plug and play recruiting team, right? You have like high level, um, you have our head of sourcing helping come up with the sourcing roadmap. You have a recruiting manager helping direct like strategy and implementation. And then you actually have the senior recruiters that are actually executing day to day, fully dedicated to your team and helping you deliver those outcomes. Yeah. And so how, in terms of kind of the incentive chain, like how are you tying your people, which it sounds like, you know, there's, you guys are under retainer and you're, you're almost staff hog for recruiting. Plus you bring your tech, plus you bring your resources. Like how are yep. you aligning your people to you know, be financially incented to deliver outcomes for the the clients. We do a few different things to align interests with our team. And the big pitch, like value prop of coming here versus other firms or 
um, anywhere else for that matter, is one, we have better work-life balance. Uh, we're all about outcomes. So as I've mentioned earlier a few times, like the results of how we, we work isn't like, oh, work 50, 60 hours a week. Although we will do that to like stabilize accounts and make sure that they're off on a good foot, like good foot and the right start. But beyond that, if we can get the same like results in 30 or 35 hours and hire the people that our customers want, that's the outcome, right? So you can have a better work-life balance. Second to that, we're also doing a lot of, um, you're going to learn a ton. You're going to learn all these different sectors, even recruiters on our team that are um, plugged in and like XYZ customer, they will still learn all of our other customers. We do like weekly tutorials and intros with our team um, to like teach them about our entire um, customer base and what they're working on. So those are like two things that aren't obviously money incentives, but we also do some other things that are pretty interesting, right? Um, One, we pay the same compensation, regardless if you're in the Bay Area or New York City or in the middle of Kansas. In fact, um, so we probably pay in like the 90th percentile in like Iowa versus California, we're probably in like the 50th percentile. Uh, but like, that's nice because anywhere you work, whether it's you have anywhere US based, like your compensation is the same, which is really cool. Um, and then we also are very flexible on hours. So like, we don't care. We have a lot of team members that have families and kids. And we basically, part of our ethos is sharing with them that like, you should never miss a kid's soccer game. You should never miss a family event or a birthday or anything like that to work here. Just communicate that you need this time off and we'll make sure that you get it. Um, one of the cool things we do for some recruiters, depending on what account they're on, we'll do crypto airdrops. So we drop our recruiters based off incentives, uh, a certain amount of crypto. It's not trivial. Um, amount so yeah so i'd love to dig into that and we you know in the pre-show we talked a bit about uh i was really inspired by one of your one of your tweets about you know how you all have specialized in web3 and crypto like uh first of all like how much of that kind of stuff is your business now in terms of targeting web3 startups and then secondarily like what was the journey to get to this place like why why this as opposed to you know enterprise SaaS or something like that yeah, I, I, I talk about Web3 quite a bit. Uh, it's definitely something I'm passionate about, just given like how I started the company, right? I was, I was really poor, forced to drop out during great financial crisis because basically the bank's failing. Uh, so decentralized like banking was really interesting to me. Um, we still work in enterprise SaaS, just to be clear. We have some amazing customers across like the Web2 sphere of health tech SaaS and a bunch of other um, industries. And so... Uh, <laughs> although my personal passion is Web3, I'd say it makes up about 50% of our business right now uh, in growing. Um, and we're definitely the leaders in that space. How we got into it uh, early, or I guess late 2017, we had a few recruiters interested in the space. Um, and I've been around crypto for some time, started investing, uh, ended up landing our first big customer in the space, which is Coinbase. And I don't know if they're technically Web three, but they're like web 2.5. So like a good intermediate into the space. And basically, um, since then, we've worked with a lot of major players in the space, at least the ones that are scaling very large. So like Consensus, Protocol Labs, uh, Trust Token, Stellar Development Foundation, um, to name a few, and a lot of others as well. Uh, and, I, and I think the nice thing about our model, when you look at like web three holistically, is there is... Um, there's basically like, you're looking at like these decentralized autonomous organizations. And the the nice thing with our model is it actually fits really well into that because these companies want to be distributed and they want like project teams. They don't want like full-time teams. And so they don't need full-time recruiters. They might need recruiters for six, 12 months and then stop hiring. And that's something that we, our model lends itself very well to. So that's a long-winded way of saying uh, the, the, the story of how we got into three. Yeah. Well, so I, I, in the pre-show, we talked a bit about, you asked what my journey was to crypto, and then I never asked about your journey into Web3. And you just talked about, you know, how it affected the business. Why, what it, what about that world is, you know, gives you passion? Um, and also, you're free to tell everybody that you thought my my way to get into the space was BS, but curious about, uh, curious <laughs> about those two things. No, I, I think it's great. Uh, anyone that's adopting, like, an early adopter. And I still think we're really early. Yeah. Um, I think you're ahead of the curve in that regard. So I have nothing bad to say about anybody. It's, uh, it's at least curious about the space, right? So <laughs> I, 
I All think, right, I'm, whatever, I think, whatever insult that just was, I'm taking offense to it. <laughs> keep, keep going. Keep going. Uh, so, so I think, yeah, I think the space is going to continue to grow, like over the next, especially in our space, the way that we look at it from a, just talk about the business and less so about like Web three. We think that our competitors and what what's traditionally called like RPO are in manufacturing and like supply chain and warehouse and banking. We think that those industries are going to decline over the next decade. Whereas Web3, SaaS, um, health tech and green tech, where we're focused, are going to basically, especially the Web3 side, we're going to see revenues basically 10x across the board, whereas they'll have declining revenues and they'll basically put us the leader of this space in the next decade. And so that's kind of where we're focusing our efforts is on those four main core competencies um, and happy to dive more on the Web3 three, three, three stuff. But there's a there's a whole strategy behind it, at least for us uh, internally. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I love picking a, a wave of an industry that's growing and uh, and you've been smart. There's a ton of money flowing into Web3 and they need people. So you're, you're an, an amazing <laughs> intersection here. So, when, you know, you've you've finished up with the company today, really in this RPO model, which the way you describe it is so much better than direct hire or commission based only or even retain search. Like, so kudos to you. Cause I've seen, you know, I, I've been on, you know, recruiting efforts where we needed to hire somebody. We went out and got four direct hire folks. One of them made a ton of money and everybody else made no money. And, um, you know, so I, I love that you've ended up at this model now, which sounds like just like a better business than being in the, the plain old direct hire recruiting. What, um, what was the model when you started? And it was probably, was it just you? Is that how the business started? Just you getting clients? Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say though, the counterpoint is like right now, the last two years, we know <laughs> empirically, we probably can make a lot more money doing the direct hire placement model. So it's less about short term. We're focused on again, like the 10 year plan um, of like supporting customers and building like that that network and relationships with, with them um, as opposed to like one off, we could definitely make more money. I mean, fees right now are 30% of first year's base. So you, and we make hundreds of hires. So you can do the math on that. Um, it'd be much more ex expensive than our, uh, <laughs> the other pricing I quoted, which is 15 to 25 K a month. Uh, that said, how I started, uh, I started with direct hire placements. So at 22, I'd reach out to these CEOs and founders and say, Hey, I have these like amazing engineers. Uh, are you interested in hiring them? It's 20% to hire them, right? It doesn't cost anything if you don't. And so that's kind of how I got started um, and was kind of off the races from there. So uh, yeah, that's kind of the high level. And then actually how we have found this RPO model was out of happenstance. When I started the company, I had no idea what RPO was. <laughs> it's like no clue. Um, and so we'd hire, or I would hire two or three engineers and it cost like, let's say $90,000. And then the companies, their startups, they're like, oh, we can't work with anymore. Our recruiting budget's exhausted. So I said, I basically came up with a model in my head. Well, what if over four or five months, I hire the same amount, but I just charge a monthly fee, right? And that's how we fell into this recruiting as a service model, not even having any context what our PO was at the time. So, so you basically stumbled, well, you saw a better way to do a, your business, which is guarantee cash flow. <laughs> and then, yeah. so you kind of stumbled. <laughs> and then you, Definitely a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then later on, you just discovered like, oh, like this is a, existed otherwise. I just didn't know. Is that, is that what you said? <laughs> Correct. Yes. Uh, they call it RPO. We call it RAS. And so a uh, little bit different service delivery model, but very similar. I think most people consider it RPO, but. It's really fascinating. And then, so how long did you go until you hired your first, first employee? Uh, yeah, so going back in time, we didn't really scale a business. So like to give more context there, I started as a firefighter to bootstrap my business. So I literally worked on the weekends. I worked like seven days a week for like two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked three days on, four days off in firefighting. And so uh, <laughs> it was a very unique start to things. But um, we, didn't, we didn't hire our first employee till. 2013, 2014, maybe a year or two after. And then we didn't, I didn't fully, I didn't stop firefighting until 2016, um, early 2016. And then the business has been full time effort since then. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and so you said, you said that you're typically charging, you know, in the RPO model, RAS model, sorry, 
Um, you're charging 15 to 25 K per dedicated resource per month kind of extrapolating from there, you know, especially if you're paying Bay Area wages, that that's not, you know, that's not the highest of gross margins. So just curious about how you, you think about that in terms of, you know, the, the business and the value you're bringing to the clients. Yeah. So we definitely don't pay the most for recruiters. We have a lot of recruiters that join us because we work with the best customers in the world on any RPO firm, hands down. You can look at our Rolodex of customers and they're all tier one tech companies um, in one way or another, whether it's the, the four industries we talked about, whether it's web three or web two health tech, uh, we're working with pretty much everyone that's very, very notable. So for recruiters, the reason they join us again goes back to like learning and opportunity. A lot of our recruiters end up converting with our customers and that's like a natural progression. In fact, we have a transition program where we help folks move into industry and help them negotiate salary. Um, I think one thing actually to note is um, we had a recruiter convert recently and they're going to make, I won't give the exact number, but it's somewhere between five hundred dollars and $750,000 their first year. Wow. Their first year, just because one year earnings. Uh, so yeah, it's and pretty sure I understand of, And we're the only ones that can do that. And to make sure I understand that's conversion, that's where you're letting your clients uh upon mutually agreeable recruit your people out yep. and then pay you a fee then i assume they pay you a fee for 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 that that's yeah um generally speaking i mean we actually have a transition program where we after a certain set of time like that you've been at job moms will actually help introduce you to like the different vcs that we partner with or the different tech like past or present customers or just people on our network and actually help you give you it's similar to like um the bain or mckinsey model where you can have like three months to basically transition out and they'll pay you to interview and uh, help you interview you help interview and um, make introductions to their network. It's similar to that. And so it's yeah. part of our model where we help people go in. So sometimes there's a fee, sometimes there's not. It really just depends on where people are at in their life cycle here. So super cool. And you said thir so 35 people today and then you're taking it to 70 this year. In the next two months. <laughs> in the next, oh, well, we, we, yes. So I take a whole year for that. So, yeah. So, what, um, you know, that seems like a pretty quick trajectory to grow 100% in two months. Like, what's, what's going on? Yeah. So, based off uh, quality and uh, outcomes for our customers, we have just to give you an idea, I was talking to one of um, my colleagues in the RPO space. They're like, yeah, we've had a busy January, we've had five leads put in perspective and i was like oh that's awesome congrats uh they're like how many have you had and and it, we've had over 35 plus leads to start this month not including our customers asking for more resources those are mm -hmm. net new leads uh and so we've kind of built a brand around quality and outcomes and because of which everyone wants to work with us um and furthermore like i'd also be concerned about any of our competitors that have capacity right now because it just speaks more about the lack of quality or uh especially right now we're in the golden era of like recruiting, there should be like no resources available if you're actually delivering outcomes for your customers. So that's my yeah. two cents on it. <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. Well, so that that definitely kind of ties into where I was hoping we would go next. So, you know, in terms of, uh, you, you talked about, you know, you've had a great January for leads. So congratulations, um, sounds well-deserved. What, you know, what is the typical way that people are finding out about the business? Um, you know, you said you're revising the website. I know you're active on social media. I saw you actually do a bunch on LinkedIn too. So I'd, I'd love to dig into that. But how, how are people typically finding finding out about the business? Yeah, a lot of it's word of mouth referrals, um, almost exclusively. Uh, we do partner with different like venture capital partners um, unofficially, but we're trusted by them to help support their portfolio companies, which is a huge source of leads. Um, other than that, it's... Uh, people through either past customers, present customers, or even recruiters networks. Um, and sometimes just posting on social media. It's always surprising like posts. Just this month I posted a, a few different times and uh, some very large names reached out to us to the, just out of happenstance. So um, yeah, those are the main channels. It's not like, it's not like a traditional like SaaS model where you're gonna have like an SDR team, sales team. It's very different. I'm sure you can implement that, but it hasn't been successful in the past as much as like just organic growth essentially yeah which is again so what's what, feeling that that 35 to 70 sorry to cut you off yeah uh, no go ahead feeling the 35 to 70 growth isn't like 
it's just organic growth, right? It's not us forcing it. It's literally what um, is just slated ahead for us. And we actually could do more if we could hire more, but I think that's the most thoughtful way to do it while maintaining quality. Um, yeah. Anything faster would be catastrophic, I think. So, um, so when, yeah. when people, well, so, so I'd love to dig into, so somebody shows up as a lead. Um, so the referral uh, and then who, what is the sales process? Like who's doing it? And then how does that person go from lead to signed contract? Yes. Yeah, so we have a few different practice leads that lead like web, each of those individual practices. Um, but mostly it's split off the web three, or web two. That's where the lead will go to one of our practice leads, uh, depending on where it comes from. Sometimes I'll be involved or one of our directors will be involved with that actual sales process. Uh, probably going to open up a lot of people wanting to compete with us, but our sales cycles, like, and these are like quarter million or half million or million dollar contracts. It's less than 30 days and uh, pretty large contracts when we sign them. So, yeah. And that's just a factor of being, um, being in this market of startups where they have to move quick and they have the money to do it. Is that, that's just a byproduct. Of I, that? I think that's a big, yeah, it's a, it's a byproduct of that. Cause once they raise like a series A or B for 20, 50 million, hundred million dollars, they actually deployed that capital yesterday, right? They come to us like, hey, we need to hire all these people like last month. How can you help us? And so the contract process is much, much quicker than like normal enterprise deals. Yeah. And is that really the sweet spot, this Series A, Series B tech startups? Or do you are you working with companies further down the, the path as well? This, the sweet spot is probably like Series B and beyond, uh, up to like post IPO, like large 10,000, 100,000 plus person companies. Um, because they have such large ongoing hiring needs, it's really nice from a reoccurring revenue piece. That's not to say we also work with 10 person startups and those are awesome to work with. Um, but they all, their needs are much more comprehensive. It's not just the same as hiring a bunch of engineers. It's like lead, basically you're like, sourcing, scheduling, recruiting, and like head of talent all for that one customer with one resource. So just a different uh, dynamic for sure. Yeah. And then, so how are the, I mean, how are the contracts typically structured? So they're monthly retainers um, for your people to, to parachute into the team. Um, you know, what do those contracts look like? Do they engage with you? You know, is it month to month? Is it a, a, a you know, a multi-month or even a year-long thing? What are those contracts? Yep. Min minimum of six months. Um, average right now is about 12 to 14 months. We do lock in a pretty large amount retained. Again, it's going back to a business. Like I share with all of our customers. Again, the only reason we're able to scale is because of quality and outcomes. So like we've never had it happen, but if we weren't, if somebody wasn't happy, like we're going to do whatever it takes to make them like happy to get the outcome that they want. So we basically do very like thorough vetting and expectation setting up front to make sure that when we deliver outcomes, that's exactly what those folks are looking for. Yeah. Well, and I love how this is, I mean, it, I, this is a dirty word, so please don't get mad at me, but this is basically staff hog for recruiting. Like, I, I think it's so cool. <laughs> like, it's so much better than the, hey, like, um, let me go hire for direct hire folks. And then you're still having to run all those processes. You You bring those processes into my company and like, that just seems a lot better if I'm just trying to worry about product market fit and a bunch of other stuff, if I'm a series, you know, B plus, um, founder. So, um, definitely. Anyway, that was, yeah, that think, was a like, compliment. Looking, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, no, I, I think it is, it's a lot cleaner and I think it allows founders to spend. So what happens a lot of times we'll talk to founders early stage. They've just raised a lot of money. They need to hire. They've never hired before. And, and what ends up happening is they spend all of their time on like the administrative tasks of sourcing and scheduling and emailing candidates. Whereas like as a founder, you're now the founder of a 50 or $100 million company. You shouldn't be spending your time there. Like outsource that to us, let us own that. And then you still can interview and like help close candidates. But like, where is your time being spent? What's the ROI there? And so that's like a big hold up is because a lot of great founders want to be involved in the process. But they don't need to be involved with the minutia, and that's where we can help support them and help them grow their companies very quickly, um, like we've done for a lot of notable founders. Yeah, dig it. So, I mean, when you're engaging with these folks who are maybe relatively inexperienced business leaders, how many of them have like a defined hiring process already put together, or how many of them are opinionated in that, or are you bringing bringing and educating them on that on that process? Yeah, so I think it depends uh, on the customer and their size. Like if they're smaller, we'll help them build out best practices. Um, it, it's really nice just given our experience of working with 
100 plus companies over the last decade is we've seen the best and the worst of all recruiting practices. And so we've taken inspiration from a lot of that and reinvented like recruiting as we see it in the modern like 20, 21st century. Um, and so we're able to help like with all of that, right? Come up with a recruiting playbook, come up with a process that works empirically, help you build top of funnel with candidates, and then actually help deliver outcomes like making offers and closing and bringing in people. So. Yeah. And so you talked about having four different practices, um, one of which is Web3, Clean Tech was another one, Enterprise SaaS was another one, and there was one more that I may have forgotten. Health Tech. Uh, and health Tech. Health tech. Yep, health okay. Theory, yep. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, would I be right in assuming that those practices, like as long as there's venture money pouring into those those areas, those are going to be appealing for you? Um, would would the op- <laughs> it, a is that accurate? And b if if that you know if the money flowed it started to flow into a new area, you know, I think is that would not necessarily tie into a, a a really good target market for you to go after, or am I thinking about it the wrong way? So definitely, we're we're. Uh... I always try to continue learning about the space. And so as new tech evolves, we're definitely opportunistic. And, and, uh, and also furthermore, like it's what it interests us. Part of like the reason I started business is I want to be at the forefront of tech and work with interesting technologies. Mm-hmm. Like currently it's not a money thing. I don't care about the money. Um, I've already made decent money and I don't, I don't need to worry about that. It's really like what excites us every day, excites our team to come to work every day. And we want to work with like, the companies we work with right now, which is like, they're all at the forefront of their, their spaces, whether it's like a protocol labs, a plaid, um, Coinbase's, Robin Hoods of the world. Like those are exciting technology and like platforms and companies. And that's where we want to be is the intersection of like cutting edge technology and in recruiting. And so if there was new spaces um, that popped up in the next five, 10 years, we'll definitely be, be all over it if it's exciting in the future of work. So yeah, dig it. So, I mean, one of the things I've, and you're great on Twitter, uh, and that's how we connected. So thank you for uh, being one of the idiots that follows me. I appreciate it. Um, I I may, I may have, I I didn't get your sense of humor when I first saw your profile. I muted you for a while. And then I was like, actually, I really like, I really like Michael. I'm sorry. Confession. uh, (laughs) I was like, I can't, I could, I didn't understand it. I was like, but then I was like, oh, he's actually genuine and they're really funny. So (laughs) Uh, I thought it was like snarky, like um, shit posting, but it like, it was actually much more, uh, less like (laughs) shit posting and more just like humor. So, uh, just being being silly. Um, I don't really, uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you unmuting me. <laughs> so tell your friends who, please tell your friends who have muted me to consider, reconsider their life choices. But um, this was like, this was like two years ago. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm a better Twitterer than then, you know, like I, I mean, I do think early on in Twitter, I, there's a danger when you join a community that you let bad influences you know, reflect what you're going to mirror back to it. And, and since then, I think I've had the realization that being genuine on Twitter is I'm just, you know, I want to be a nice person on Twitter because I want to be a nice person in life. Like that's one of my core values. Like, that's awesome. and, um, so, so that's why, I, you know, I, I've seen people talk about it. They're like, I've never seen you like, you know, clap back <laughs> on somebody. It's because like, I, sometimes I want to, don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> but like, I just, I've, I just, try to be genuine on there. And it, it's paid me back tenfold. So it, including opportunities like this to talk with you. So, um, but anyway, on Twitter, you talked about the, you know, opportunities you see in the post COVID market for your, um, for your model. So lo- love to just kind of dig into that. You know, COVID has pushed everybody remote, push globalization of hiring, even, you know, accelerated that like crazy. So what do you see for both your model now and going forward in terms of the evolution of the kind of current COVID world and the post COVID world. Yeah. So it's actually a really, it was 2020 was pretty rough for recruiting as a whole. So our revenue was continually up and to the right, definitely down in 2020. Um, and that actually did a lot of things. Um, it cold the field. So we don't really have any true competitors right now. Um, it's one of the things for like growth, our specific segment, after 2020, it changed the landscape quite a bit. A few of them merged with different tech companies that absorbed them. Um, and so it's kind of, it basically opened up a lot of opportunity for us. Um, and so 
not only that, now that we don't, we previously were doing on-premise um, recruiting as a service, so all of our recruiters were on site, which was very like constrained in terms of like the amount of folks that we could hire, especially at like Bay, Bay Area or New York City salaries. Um, but now that we're able to hire anywhere across the U.S. and now globally, uh, we're able to, I think, expand services pretty rapidly. Um, like I was sharing, we're going to be 70 uh, people by the end of Q1 and, and looking to expand by the end of the year to like 100 to 200 people. We'll see kind of where things fall in Q2 and Q3. But it's really opened the door, not only for us hiring, but also for our customers, right? Because when you're only fishing in one small pond, it's the San Francisco Bay Area, and you can't afford to pay 300000 a year for an engineer, it's going to be very hard to hire somebody in San Francisco. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, as you're, as you're thinking about hitting multiple hundreds of people um, by the end of the year, like if I heard that right, that's, <laughs> wow, that's super cool. It's a good thing you know something about recruiting. Um, but uh, <laughs> like that is rocket ship level growth, right? Growing, uh, basically, if my math is right, 10x in a year, like that, how, how are you thinking about, and I don't use the word scary, but like, that seems kind of scary. Like, how are you thinking about making sure that doesn't all go to poop? Yeah. So we've thought through like structuring our, our team internally and basically delegated a lot of different things across, like setting up a really robust operations function across an organization that's help, it's going to help us scale even further and faster. Cause I personally am terrible at operations. I'm really good at sales marketing and talking and, and tweeting once in a while, but operations like finance and legal and HR and all that stuff is not, uh, not my forte. And so we've put in a really good team in place and I, I would trust them actually to run the company without me, to be honest. Um, so I think that, kind of speaks to, to their impact and ability to execute. Yeah. So how, uh, maybe that, that transitions, thank you, into the next topic I wanted to get to. So um, so we've talked about how you sell, which it, it sounds like people just call you and then they uh, you have a meeting and then they sign a contract. Congratulations on that. It sounds like you have great customers uh, <laughs> and a great service for them. But how is the, you know, how is the team, you know, organized today? You just talked about kind of, the key thing for for succeeding in this kind of hyper growth you're going through is the right organizational structure and the right people. Like, how is it organized today, and how's that going to change this year? Yeah, so some of our like core values are open communication and a flat structure. So our structure is actually pretty flat when you look at it outside looking in. There are some layers internally, like just for like keeping things flowing and, and people having direct reports and, and mentoring and training folks, but. Um, one of the big things, like for me, even as we grow from 35 to 100 or 200 or whatever the number is, is like just open, open lines of communication. So you might report to Jane, but Jane, you don't have to go to Jane with questions or anything like that that's going on internally. You can go straight to myself or you can go to anyone else in the org. That's like part of our ethos. So there's no like chain of command with communication. I think that helps um, make sure that everyone's aligned. Um, and helps people grow and learn. Um, cause I, I don't care if you're an intern or first day on the job. Like I want to hear people's thoughts and like opinions. And that's how like innovation happens. Right. Cause we might, not, we might be doing something suboptimally, but I'd love to hear what you or anybody else has to say about it. Right. So like I'm open to learning. And I think that goes back to like what you were saying earlier, which is like if a new segment uh, opens up, that's like growing, <laughs> whether, whatever it is, we want to learn about it. And so just mm -hmm. always being curious. Um, and so, to answer your question overtly, though, we basically have a few different practice leads that are like directors for their respective um, industries, whether it be Web3, Web2, and then like those micro sections within them. Um, and then underneath them, we have team leads that basically um, that are like recruiting managers, and then they have like five or six reports underneath them, right? And that's basically how it scales. Um, and then we have a whole other ops team that operationalizes like resources, HR, finance, legal, and that's like its own entity that reports up to um, myself. So, got it. So organized very much like the classical consulting practices, if if I understand that right. So <laughs> I think you mentioned PwC and some of those. Things. Is that's how they're organized, right? Or do I have that wrong? You, I have not studied their organization structure, so it may be very similar. Uh, it may not be. I have no idea. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, it we sounded great from... when I said it, so let's just go with it then. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So I dig that. So that's, you know, that's definitely. So in terms of how you're recruiting new recruiters and team building, you know, how, how are you approaching that now? How is that scaling?
Yeah, so our process is pretty robust. Um, we're obviously really good at hiring, that's, given that's what we do. So hiring recruiters is actually a lot of fun because recruiters <laughs> understand recruiting in the process pretty well. So um, it's actually been surprising. Um, we don't get as much like organic applicants as like our customers, just given like they have much larger brands. But um, a lot of our hiring actually has come from referrals, but then also me just posting on social media. I uh, mm-hmm. posted a few times in the last month or two, couple months um, that we have open recruiter roles. And we had like probably 50 plus people reach out to me, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so we've been, we've been hiring through word of mouth pretty robustly in social media um, and obviously some people that apply and just outbound sourcing. Got it. Okay. Well, and so then one thing, one thing that, maybe I don't understand, right? So you you said on social media, like there's a lot of Web3 recruiters making and, you know, making half a million dollars a year, right? And, and I, know, I know it's social media, so there's a lacking of nuance. But then you said that your typical business model is selling a team member, right, at a markup for a standard fee uh, or for a monthly fee of 15 to 25,000. Those, numbers, do those math, numbers don't add up. <laughs> those numbers don't work. Yes. So what, what nuance am I missing between the two of those? Yeah, it's a good question. So when you look at like, um, web three companies, so what happens and it depends on the company, um, they'll basically give you a base plus a token package. Um, in that package is usually pretty generous, just given the volatile nature of, um, crypto. Same thing with like, it could be a Web2 company. They could give you a large base and a large RSU grant. It's very similar. Um, and so that's what I was referencing is like that there's kind of this window in Web3 and I've been shouting it from the rooftop and trying to get a lot of my like colleagues and friends into Web3 recruiting because basically what's going to happen at some inflection point is you're going to get legacy HR and comp analysts into the Web3 space. Mm-hmm. And what will happen is they will modify that. So we'll say, hey, Michael, instead of giving you 500K a year, we know Michael will work for 200K a year. So we'll say we'll give him 150K in base and cap the tokens at 50K a year, whether the price goes up or down, which yeah. uh, is not good for employees. But right now we're in this golden window of opportunity for the next two to five years is my assumption, where you can make a lot of money. And I mean, you are taking a lot of risk, right? Because like you shared earlier in, in the, the, pot, the the recording, basically that um there's a, a lot of risk because crypto is so early and like the prices are up and down right but with that i think it'll eventually stabilize and you'll see these grants come down massively um we've already started to see it happen so like there's really like a very short window and so if you yeah. miss on this golden opportunity you will regret it the rest of your career in my opinion so <laughs> oh, okay i got you <laughs> um well i mean as you're describing that i was like oh Amazon's doing this like crazy. Like one of my yeah. companies I'm involved in just lost an employee to Amazon. And they, you know, he told me the offer and it was like, yeah, I'm going to make three times more. And I said, okay, break that down for me. And he said, <laughs> my salary is going down by 25%, but they're giving me RSUs worth yeah. two and two. 2.2 times my salary. And I said, okay, tell me about yeah. tell me about that stock grant. And he said, well, after the first year, I get 5% of it. After the second year, I get 15% more. And then after the third year, I get another half. And I was like- the Refresher. And they give a refresher grant usually too, uh, yeah. on top. I was like, you know what their turnover is in the first year, don't you? Like, have you, have you looked up? <laughs> Ask him for the stats. Ask how many people have quit in their division in this year. And he's like, uh, too late. I already accepted the offer. So, so yeah. Uh, so anyway, I not to push back. Like we'll see if things normalize, but uh, it seems like the company's ability to pull fast ones on employees has not yet exceeded the uh, the ability for employees to get taken advantage of. So anyway, that's my soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think the the Web three companies do it much differently than like Amazon's or other large yeah. um, companies in terms of like grants. And there's a lot of different structures. Um, I can't share those details, but, uh, but, but yeah, there's all sorts of structures, whether it's like a one year lockup, eight years, six years, four standard, like four years, yeah. stuff of that nature. But, um, they're usually distributed evenly. I haven't seen anything that was like backloaded, uh, in, in our experience at least. So, right. Well, I mean, I grew up, you know, I'm 47. I grew up in the age of, you know, one year cliff and monthly vesting after that, like, Kind of worked. Yeah. I don't know why we broke it. It seemed like things were going fine. Some things don't deserve to get fixed. And I understand it's a competitive environment and why it is, but um, it 
it's uh i don't i don't maybe that's a get off my lawn moment so sorry <laughs> um cool all right so uh anything more kind of on structure and operational model and stuff like that otherwise i'd love to kind of jump into your to review on the market and competitors and stuff like that sure let's jump jump into it yeah so when you're competing so it sounds like you're going to market with a relatively unique product targeted at a narrow set of customers. I love how you're able to define your customers very clearly. It's like Bay Area high growth tech startups in one of these four areas at this funding level. Like that's amazing. Um, and kudos to you because so many entrepreneurs can't define who their customers are. And I love that you can. But so you're you're going in there with, you know, a unique value proposition and a unique offering to them that I see the value in. Um, like who are you competing with or what options are you competing with when, when you're, when you're going into an opportunity? So it's really interesting. Uh, I don't think we have a direct competitor. Uh, it's very rare since pre 2020 or COVID times, we had any direct competitors and RFPs right now we compete a lot against whether like, Hey, we're going to hire these folks internally or we're going to hire temps. And, and that's really easy to compete for us because, um, the models just, it lends itself very well to work against those because you just don't have the management costs and overhead costs and like long-term commitment. Um, and also on the consulting side, like if you just hire one temp versus hiring, a call, let's say like a person through us, that person on the temp side is completely like responsible for their own success. With us, it's a business. So we don't look at it as like just Jane on an account it's Jane plus all of job moms. So like we will jump in pretty heavily to make sure folks are successful at accounts as opposed to when you have one, one person, it's kind of all the, the risks on them. So those are all like me, like competitors. I could go down like a list of like more broader competitors, but there's not many folks that do what, what we do. Yeah. Super interesting. So it sounds like when you win, it's this unique offering that you have, um, that just other people haven't, haven't done. Uh, hopefully this podcast doesn't spawn a bunch of competitors, but it's also, you know, anyway, competition is easier I said mean, than there, there's some, there's some that are similar. I'd say like the biggest one, I don't even know if they're a competitor cause we just don't, maybe we're not enough bids or they're not enough bids or vice versa. Or there's just maybe just so much of a market share It's like rocket power is probably one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, they've done well, I've got a lot of respect for, for those folks over there. Um, in the past, like. And the reason is the biggest competitor in the past was Bink. They were acquired by Robinhood. And we actually work with them now at Robinhood, which is uh, pretty amazing. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, our main competitor got absorbed earlier or last year by Robin, uh, Robinhood directly, absorbed their entire recruiting team, like 100 people. Um, and then other than that, um, there's another one that was a spinoff of that that, uh, that went under in 2020. So. Um, those were like our main competitors and, and, uh, rocket power is a little bit different than what we do model wise. Um, so yeah, that's probably the closest competitor. So speaking kind of from like a investor perspective, like as you think about competitively your business, like what are the defensive moats that keep other people from coming in and competing with you? It's, it sounds like brand is one network is another. What, what other things are, how do you think about your business and defensibility as it grows? Yeah, so I think I think the big thing is like carving out niches, right? And that's why we're focused on these different segments. It's like wanting to be the best in, and I know for a fact we're the best in at what we do. And not only that, specifically like Web three, uh, there's no one that has the same customers or help these customers go through scale because there's no other comp companies that have gone through scale at um, the same way that like a consensus or protocol labs have in the last couple of years. Um, and so. The big thing is like network and going from zero to one uh, in quality. Like a lot of times, like even larger RPOs that want to like reach out to acquire us and stuff of that nature, like it's very common that they can't replicate it because they don't have the people internally to actually execute or the network to break into startups because they're not going to trust a couple thousand person RPO company to provide the same quality as like a boutique firm like we are currently. So I think a lot of it comes down to quality. There's a lot of we have a lots of competitors that pop up. They're small, like five, 10, 20 people, and then disappear very quickly because you will churn accounts left and right if you do not have a high quality bar. Um, and our NPS score is like over 90% retention and renewals, which is really good in this industry. Like long term customers, really happy sending us referrals. Um, and even like the 10% that doesn't renew. 
they still have positive outcomes from like a high earning standpoint. Yeah. Um, just priority shift. So anyways, very high customer attention in the industry. Yeah. And so who, who is responsible for that NPS like accounting? Are you having the practice directors do it or is the central centralized group doing it? Yeah, it depends on the accounts, um, but we have different account leads that will basically measure outcomes, submit um, weekly metrics reports, submit quarterly ROI reports. That's something we do that nobody else does. Uh, we do quarterly ROI reports. So we'll literally add up, here's what we're working on. Here's what we promised we would deliver. Here's what we actually delivered. Here's your cost per hire and actually send a full report. And it's actually really nice for our customers because you're like a head of TA. You actually have to or like a VP of talent acquisition or head of people, you'd actually have to go to finance and justify why you're spending all this money with high paid consultants. And so it just gives them ammunition to renew us, which is really nice. So something we do that's uh, very unique, but also like lends itself well to getting contract extensions (laughs) because they have all the ammunition to do it. And I love that compared to, you know, compared to more classical kind of consulting or like management consulting, for example, like it's incredibly difficult for them to characterize ROI there, right? And you see these, yeah. you see these, you see these, you know, RPO groups and whatnot try to like harmonize all that and be like, well, we just made you a million dollars. Yeah, in fantasy land, like it's just so hard. But it, <laughs> you know, I love your space. Like you can quantify, like we brought you this many hires, like this was your goal. Um, yeah, that's, that's super fun. So, you know, one thing, that distinguishes really good businesses from okay businesses, kind of the cash conversion cycle. So how do your customers pay you? Are they on net 30? Are they paying you ahead of time? Like how, how is all that working? Yeah. So <laughs> we, uh, we'll get into the, like, the very like nitty gritty of a few details, but I can tell you that we get paid about 30% of the contract before we start. Um, mm-hmm. So before we even engage for, let's say just for mass sake, a hundred thousand dollar contract, we would get $30,000 up front. Um, and that's non-refundable. So, um, it locks, it locks in. So basically like, yeah, we have some different like retention mechanisms that, that lend itself well. Cause like what we found is like customers, if we go through the, our process and can hit our goals in terms of like timelines, we can deliver the outcomes they want. And so it's really important that like, Hey, I know it's month one. A lot of cut. So what happens a lot of times to customers come like as you mentioned earlier when they raise a large, large amount of money, they want to raise, they want to hire immediately, and so look at the end of month one and be like, what's going on? Why haven't we hired anyone? And it's like, hey, it doesn't just happen, right? It's an organic process. It takes a month, like two to four weeks, to ramp up, start to build funnel, and then months two through six, you're going to see a ton of results. And so we want to lock our customers in, not because we want to retain them. If they want to cancel, like you can have your money back. I really don't care about it. It's more to just engage to a certain amount of time to make sure that we see the outcomes that we promised and that will happen a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. And so what, what percentage of your people are actually deployed, uh, as team members in this, in this model and at what percentage are overhead? No offense to oh, you. Cause good. I assume good, you're overhead. Good too. question. Yeah. Good question. So we only have, we have really high margin business mainly because our overhead internally is very um, very low. Uh, we only have two folks that are tr- or like internal one that handles HR and like internal onboarding and hiring and the other that does internal hiring. And that is the only, and myself. And so like the only other, that's the only on, like overhead that we truly have. Everyone else is doing a dual world where they're actually consulting for customers and bringing in revenue for the business, as well as doing other leadership responsibilities. So a normal like profit margin for us is much better than traditional staffing or other firms. We probably range in the 55 to 60% profit margin uh, range, which right now it doesn't really matter. Like we're not monetizing the business in the traditional sense. We have zero. It's one, it's my, myself, I'm a solo founder. I have zero investors. Um, so it's a completely bootstrap business and all of that money right now, a hundred percent of it is being rolled back into the business for growth. So there's no, no me getting rich off of cash flow or anything like that. It's a hundred percent reinvested back into the business right now. So, yeah, that's super admirable, and I'm glad your your customers are happy with it. What um what you know what are you doing to kind of protect your biggest asset, which is your people, right? Like, um, 
you know, especially, you know, s- sometimes people in services businesses, they say, okay, well, I'm just going to be the owner. And the way I protect this is I'm the only one selling anything. So I own the customer relationship, but it sounds like you're not doing that. You're distributing that. You know, how are you kind of making sure that, you know, 15 people don't decide to leave and compete with you? <laughs> yeah. So it's a good question. I think, um, we've given folks some really amazing opportunities in terms of growth and, and opportunity. And I think the big thing that like from an ethos standpoint, I think early in my career, we worked with like 2012 timeline. I worked with a few folks and just didn't like, we did really, really, I did really good work for them. And it's always like those folks will give you like a recommendation, like, Hey, Jesse's great to work with. They'll never go out of their way. And so like part of our, my mission, like goal to help our team members is like, Hey, if you come here and you, commit a year of your life or career here, I'm going to be a career advocate for you for the rest of your career. So if you ever need a reference, you just text me, call me, whatever. I will jump on the phone the same day with whoever it is that needs a reference. And I told them that you're the truth, which is you're the best recruiter at X, right? And make it sure that it's the best reference you've ever gotten. I'll go out of my way to make introductions to other people in my network. So if you spend time here, and that's the same way for our leadership team as we expand, they have that same mentality. We will make it 10x your worthwhile, like in your career in the long run, because I'm still young. I'm 32. I've got another decade or two left uh, in my career. I don't plan on retiring anytime soon. <laughs> oh, uh, no. I feel and- insulted. I feel seen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, I think just being that career advocate for people makes a huge difference. And, and that's actually why we've had like, we've had like three or four people boomerang back and actually a few more that are coming back um, after already going in-house and making a lot more money because they like the culture. They like working with myself and our leadership team. And I think that speaks volumes to our culture and like how we operate as a business. And I think yeah. that's going to help us long-term in retaining folks. Cause it's not a money thing, right? Like um, I think the biggest thing that we offer is like, it's a, it's not, a, I hate the word family in business. Like, cause it's not, I, I completely think it's like an odd thing to use, but it's like a community, right? So when we think about um, supporting folks, it's not like we're as business, a family or a community that helps you spend more time with your family and your friends, because we can help you be efficient and hit your outcomes and work six hours a day instead of 10. And so that is how we're like support our employees. And that's much more value, pe- valuable to people that are like have a family and have um, things they want to do outside of work as opposed to working at um, other companies, which might be different culturally. So, yeah. Well, so how does it, you, you've talked about this, like this, this balance that your team members are able to have, like they don't necessarily need to live in the Bay area. They get paid a Bay area salary living in Kansas or Texas or wherever. And, but at the same time, you're dropping them into these environments where, you know, those it's every, 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 you know, all stops are being pulled because they just got a big bunch of uh, VC money to try to win a market. Like, how do you gel that you're deploying this person into a culture, which to some extent is having to sacrifice work-life balance, but a core part of what you're telling me, a value proposition is work-life balance, you know, as being part of your company. Yeah. So, I would say that, and we're pretty upfront with folks that join us, that like the first one to three months of any account is going to be like stabilizing. And so that's going to be a lot more work than on the back end. Um, so a lot more hours up front than like in the long run. Um, obviously, we want to get to a stable place after like the first month or two to where like you're, it's really about efficiency. Like I, I, I don't think people actually spend eight hours a day working, right? Like not even close to it. So if we're just much more efficient and get the outcomes and like metrics that we know track towards X amount of hires, then we can we can do that. And we track metrics weekly, so we're able to like get updates on progress reports based off empirical data that we have that can show that we're going to hit these outcomes in two months, right, or three months, or four months. Um, and so that's we're very much like data driven as opposed to like you need to be in here at the office from eight to five. Like we don't right. care about that. It doesn't matter to us. Uh, and, and we obviously we prep our customers for that. Like, yeah, we're going to respond after hours on Slack and like text but it's going to be like hey michael i see your text uh, i acknowledge what you said i'm going to get back to it first thing in the morning when i, I jump back online if it's obviously it's something urgent like making an offer or something like that will flex but even then like i tell i'll tell all of our team members like hey if you work 35 hours monday through thursday take off early on friday 
And like, if the customer or anything has anything, like send them my way and I'll talk to them. Cause I'm not, I'm probably the only one that works like 60 hours a week, but everyone else is uh, on the 40 hour <laughs> work week <laughs> or less. So totally dig it. Well, so, um, you know, where do you, where, where do you want to take the business? Like you, you just kind of talked about wanting to work another decade or so. Uh, and as a 47 year old, <laughs> I feel insulted, but, um, you know, what are you thinking in terms of where you want to take this business, eventual outcome, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So right now we're expanding services. I think, um, the end goal is to be one of the RPO leaders. Um, We've had it's just interesting. I've I've talked to a, a lot of uh, the major players in the space, and a lot of them have tried to acquire us over the years. Going back to like 2017, we had acquisition offers, and we declined those, thankfully, because it would have been so much worse in hindsight. But it was a really good offer at the time, uh, <laughs> and um, basically, we want to be the leader in the space. And I think that that's where we're trending. Where over the next 10 years, we can basically take a foothold in the space as a lot of those legacy revenues decline and our customers keep going up and to the right. And so it's just a, a long-term game starting to build those different uh, different branches and different muscles and expand into other services, which we're starting to do. So Yeah. Well, it does, you know, I, I do think it'll be interesting to see, you know, with any any people-based, consulting-based business, you know, the, the always the challenge is how much equity can an owner build up, right? And and it ties back to kind of some of those moats, whether it's brand or scale or customer relationships. Um, you know, I think it'll be exciting to watch and see, you know, how that transpires over the next decade. And I mean, based on what I've heard from you so far, like it's, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Normally I'd be like, oh, that sounds really hard. But like, you know, you've, you've, you're thinking about the business really in a way that's inspiring, right? It's very fundamentals, lots of tactics, uh, and not being greedy in the short term, which is super cool. A lot of people are, especially in Web3, are short-term greedy. So um, anyway, that's that's how it feels sitting on this side of the table. That's, that's kind of you to say. I, I appreciate the, the kind words. I think um, I think that a lot of the like traditional RPO companies were started you know, 20, 30 years ago. And so we're coming at it from a different lens, right? Looking at like the future of technology and really trying to go with that uh, those flows of business as they continue to grow. So again, it's a long-term lens. I think there's a lot more money to be made in the short term doing other things. Um, but for us, it's a five to 10 year plan. So yeah, we're super excited. dig it. Super dig it. Long-term thinking totally works. Um, so one thing I have noticed, like um, you are active on LinkedIn. LinkedIn to me seems like a cesspool. Um, some of your content on LinkedIn seems like you take your Twitter content and put it on LinkedIn. So I'd love to hear, like, how are you thinking about these different platforms, like Twitter and LinkedIn especially? Yeah, so for our business, LinkedIn is obviously really important. I, I don't like a lot of things about LinkedIn. I very much prefer Twitter. Uh, <laughs> um just there's a lot of fake posts, uh, I guess, on both platforms, but LinkedIn seems to have a lot of prevalent, like I ran through the rain to make this interview. So I, I generally just try to help folks, right? Like what's the future of work? What's the future? Like how can you help improve like your interview processes? And that's kind of where I, I think through. Um, and I get a lot of questions actually around like how much time I spend creating content. The answer is zero. Like I very, it's just random thoughts or conversations I have with people like yourself throughout the day. And I'm like, oh, I got this idea from Michael and I's conversation today. Right. And so like, that's what inspires me. It's not like spending a lot of time uh, with a marketing strategy or long tweet thread. Like I don't have time for it, to be honest. I wish I did. Yeah. But, uh, it sounds fun, but. I actually talked to one of uh, a guy who took a salary cut to go work for Gary V. And, and, you know, Gary Vanderchuk, right? Which, you know, okay, yeah, like he's course. running around like buying baseball cards at, at, uh, <laughs> at garage sales and stuff. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, but the guy is quietly, you can't, you can't doubt that he has a genius for what he's doing. Um, first of all, like there's no way I can talk contempor extemporaneously for two hours like he does. Like, I just don't know how people do that. Um, but second of all, like he's just really, 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 very talented and insightful about it. And, you know, the guy that worked for him um, said that they have a very specific kind of philosophy on being out there on social media, which is the CEO of the company needs to go out there and be themselves and talk about their journey. And he said, look, if we if we if you came to work with our social media agency, the first thing we would do is hire a film crew to follow you around all day, because I guarantee there is at least 20 minutes of interesting content that we can produce out of that every single day. And that's what you put on social media being a real you. 
And uh, I was like, man, that is really smart. <laughs> like, I think that's really good. That is, and, that is really smart. It's good the writing. cool thing I think about as I read your Twitter, as I read um, you hating on my Twitter, as I read, <laughs> as I read your, your LinkedIn, like, it's really you. Like, you're being a real person on there. And so many people don't. And it's just a, um, you know, it's just a mistake. It's just a wasted effort. It's what it feels like. I totally agree. And in, that, in, in my defense, I did, I did pretty sure I pinged you a couple months ago saying I was really enjoying your content. So I'm pretty sure there's a DM in your Twitter account. You can see that it said oh, like thanks. back in August or September. Uh, well, that was me well, being authentic too. Like I was well, enjoying your content. <laughs> well, you know, I get so many of those. It's impossible to answer them. All. No, but th thank you very much. Hopefully I at least click the little thank you thumbs up button on it or something. Uh, um, but it is part of the challenge, right? If you want to go and be nice on social media and be a genuine person. And if you're a caring, giving person, people will just keep asking, you know, and it becomes overwhelming. Uh, and it's something I've really struggled with. Um, so I don't know. I feel like I'm whining. So <laughs> if I'm whining, no, no, I, I totally get it, uh, especially because the field that I'm in, folks reach out for jobs often, right? So like I'm getting hundreds of messages a week across both platforms, yeah. um, which is awesome. Like I'm really uh, flattered that folks want to chat with me. I just wish there was more hours in the day to help everybody. Right. So um, I've gotten very good at saying no, or not right now, <laughs> or talk to this person. Right. So uh, yeah, I totally get it. Um, it's, it's a nice, like, it's something you don't think about when you start creating content, right? Like I didn't think that people would ever reach out to me for advice or like feedback on as regularly as they do. Um, so oftentimes I'll create content around like a lot of questions I'm getting, but that's the only time I really like focus on content creation because I don't have time to chat with everybody. Yeah. Well, it is this interesting aspect of human nature. If you're out there on social media, just like I talked about Gary Vee, like we know Gary Vee, Gary Vee doesn't know who I am. <laughs> right. But like, yeah. you know, social yeah. media and being out there, the people start to feel like they know you they know and you. Yeah. then they're going to reach out to you and talk to you. Like they're somebody that, you know, th is a friend. And friends do things for each other, but it turns out I'm not Gary Vee's friend. He has no business to answer my stuff. Um, so it creates this weird dynamic. And, you know, people often on the other side, it's they'll even take it further where they get mad at you. It's like, I thought we were friends. It's like, no, I don't know who you are. We're not friends. It doesn't work that way. Um, so it, it's really, it's like uh, asymmetric friends, like a really a weird thing. So I don't know. Um, and I often, I've had friends that are like super duper famous, like can't go out in public famous. And like, that sucks. Like I told my son that this morning, I was like, dude, you want to know why I drive a Subaru son? No attention, <laughs> no attention. Like just stay under the radar. Nobody's got to mess with you. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I drive, I think I was posting on the same post you were yesterday. I was like, I drive a Camry and all my co, all my employees, I'm pretty sure have better cars than me. The ones I've seen yeah. at least. So. That's the way it's, like being it's, casual. It's just, <laughs> Again, yeah. casual, a casual shirt. I uh, just don't, no new jewelry, no watch, nothing. Just <laughs> nobody yeah. can identify me. Hopefully. Well, it's, so. it's interesting because some people really talk about not being motivated by money. Um, and then, then you see revealed preference behind that. Like, like I believe when you said it, I believe it. Like I truly do the way you've structured your business, the type of car you drive, you know, the way everything's put together, like that's true. Um, so yeah, I admire that in you. So kudos to you for not being full of it. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> Uh, I'll, have to, I'll not post if I ever buy a Corvette or Ferrari uh, on social. <laughs> you'll, look, you'll send me this audio clip. <laughs> Take whatever it back. Makes you, whatever makes you happy, man. <laughs> whatever makes you. I think you can. I think you can own a Ferrari or a Lambo and not be motivated by money. <laughs> like totally, you know, that's totally fine. Uh, and I think you could be own a Ferrari and Lambo and be motivated by money. The only thing I would have a problem with is somebody running around virtue signaling that they're not motivated by money and they really are. Right. That's, that's BS to me. I'm not interested in that at all. So I'm not interested at all. Um, cool. All right. Is there anything about your business that we didn't cover that's interesting? I feel like we got the whole, uh, the whole colonoscopy on it. So thank you for that. No, no, that was uh, a loss. I think I'm going to have uh, new new team members watch this as a way to understand the business better. So. <laughs> oh, super cool. Super cool. Well, um, so do you have an audience for this? Um, you know, and last week's episode was our most downloaded ever episode. So I'm very excited to announce that. Uh, but what, what way can um, me, my, I'm going to promote this on social media. What the people that listen to this, what way can we support you find out more about the business? What would be helpful to you? Yeah, don't no asks on my end. Happy to support the content. Obviously, really appreciate you having me on. And uh, 
you know, uh, if anyone's ever hiring and needs help, uh, even if it's not, I, I, the type of conversations I am happy to have with like leaders, uh, business leaders or founders is like walking people through like how I go about hiring. And that doesn't have to be with us. It could be just like hiring your own team. And those are things that really like excite me. And I'm happy to have those conversations. So if you're leading a team or looking at building a recruiting, uh, building a team this year, happy to have conversations directly with folks. And you can find me on Twitter at Jesse Tinsley or on LinkedIn and uh, DMs are open. Happy to chat with anybody who reaches out. So yeah. And for those of you on YouTube, I just pulled up uh, your LinkedIn page. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, LinkedIn slash in Jesse Tensley. So super cool and a great follow. I totally agree um, that people should follow you on Twitter. I enjoy it, even though you muted me. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> there should be a plug, actually. Uh, people can get even up. I'm okay it with group, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, sometimes you hear it where people are like, they're talking about you. I'm like, I have no idea. Uh, but also, like, you, you just learn not to care. That's you got. You got to have that if you're on social media. If you disagree with me, like, I don't care. So, awesome, man. This is so cool. I learned. I learned a lot. This this RPO model. Um, our, our, the RAAS model, like a recruiting as a service model. Like, I love it. Like, thanks for educating me on this and really opened my eyes to really what's possible. So I definitely learned some stuff and thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me on.